Hi, Stella. Hi there. We're speaking with Eliza Mondegreen today. And Eliza is a graduate student studying online trans and detrans communities. She also studies the knowledge, attitudes and beliefs underpinning affirmative care. Yeah, her, her work is important because it's really impossible to understand what's going on right now with gender in the culture, gender dysphoria, sudden onset gender dysphoria, ROGD, without understanding what happens in these online communities. And Eliza's graduate work and her writing about this has actually been instrumental. Um, in addition to all of the reporting she's done inside the EPATH and WPATH conferences, which we've covered a little bit before in our show. Yeah, let's kick straight into the episode. It's very interesting. Yeah. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Welcome, Eliza. We're so glad Thank to have so you. Thank you so much for having me on. Hello there. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited um, because I think a lot, I'm not the, the only one who's been following your work. And you kind of arrived with, I think you arrived very suddenly into kind of this world and uh, you, you know, you present so much thoughtful analysis. It's it's been a real addition to our understanding. So I think today's conversation is going to be very interesting. No <laughs> you always deliver, Eliza. So, um, I mean, I think for people who are not familiar with your background story, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about what you were doing before gender came across your radar and then how you 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 have some personal reasons Mm -hmm. why you started to become really interested in this so maybe take us back before you were eliza mondegreen the gender researcher Hmm. i'll do my best um so i've had a lot of opportunities to think like you know what what is an area of my background that gender made really relevant i think that's something a lot of us think about and for me I have always had this fascination with a couple of things that I really see at play in, in gender. And one of them is, um, you know, I had a personal history as like an adolescent dealing with um, anorexia and like just having this great, like terror is not too strong a word for the feelings that I had about just like growing into like adult female body, adult female sexuality. And so I took this, you know, very extreme pathological escape route. And and that's something that has often seemed to me, like, I I look at the girls who are going for gender, getting sucked into gender, and it's like, boy, this just looks like the same thing to me. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. I also just have always had this kind of attraction to things that are very hard to understand. Um, so I spent most of my teenage years and my my years in university studying uh, totalitarian regimes and in particular studying the history of the Nazi regime because when I ran into that as a kid, I felt like I had to understand how human beings could do those kinds of things. And I read everything that I could possibly touch on the subject. And I, at the same time I was reading, you know, 1984 and how language can mold what we're even able to think about. And that was a concept that, you know, it's it's Mm. fascinated me. It's never let go of me. And all of these things really did come into play Mm. when gender started to come onto the scene for me, like, yeah. And can I ask, when when you had anorexia in your teens, did you know that you were running away from your womanhood and your female body? Did you did you have an inkling of that, yeah. or when did you come to realize? Or how did you, when did you come to frame that? It's hard to say when that interpretation crystallized. 
what I remember is that I was yeah. really uncomfortable when, you know, people that I didn't know well started commenting on my body. And when it just mm -hmm. felt like I'd become this like public property. And I really hated, mm. you know, I hated my period. I hated those changes that were happening and I just wanted it to stop. And I think it was later that it was like, yeah, it was all of these things connected to a fear of growing up, a fear of being like sexualized, a fear of being seen in a particular way, things that I all see at play. It's funny, in a straight, yeah, in a strange way, I can see a, a thread between anorexia and being fascinated with totalitarian <laughs> regimes. It's 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 something along the lines of the the harshness, mm. the the kind of steel trap mind, the the kind of the totalitarian mindset of the anorexic. Yeah. If you follow me, it's it's so consuming. I I can kind of see how you could easily be really really interested in that side of the human mind, having come out. Yeah, of Yeah, I mean the interesting thing is that those were kind of simultaneous, and so I had this interest in understanding totalitarianism from a deep horror of totalitarianism while I'm kind of exacting this totalitarian regime on my body. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating, actually. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like when therapists talk about like trying to master something on the outside that you are struggling yeah. with mm -hmm. on the inside. Like when you find yourself in this pattern, it's really yeah. interesting. And also, as you were talking, I'm thinking, oh, you know, just a very typical girly interest <laughs> of like being obsessed with Nazis yeah. and totalitarian regimes, you know. And I always thought, like, I wonder if there's a gender for that. Like, oh, what is the gender identity that describes a person who's obsessed with totalitarianism? Yeah. Totalitarian yeah. gender or something? Like, there has to be. Yeah. To 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 okay. Gender. <laughs> okay, so so these two things are happening in your life mm -hmm. at the same time, like this intellectual curiosity and also this kind of totalitarian behavior towards mm -hmm. your own body through anorexia. Um, and that was around what age were um, you? So I had, I was dealing with the eating disorder from about 14 to 17. And I had this, okay. yeah, I had this fascination with trying to understand totalitarianism and especially the interaction between like totalitarian regimes and language and medicine. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really from about mm -hmm. 13 or 14, well into my 20s, that this was just like my... That's super interesting. My driving preoccupation was just like, I have to figure this out. Um, and then... That really did coincide with events in my personal life where like one of my closest friends and then, you know, other friends went on to, to do similar things. But, um, you know, I had a friend who was going through a hard time and really seized on transition as the answer. And I think that there had been things that I had been prepared to passively accept or to not interrogate to the extent that they didn't intrude on my life. And I think when you see someone go through that up close, it really forces you to question the gap between like the narrative and what you're seeing. With your with your friend, I know you probably mm -hmm. don't want to divulge too many details, but was this a person who you, you had seen as always very, very gender non-conforming, like she kind of fits in more with the guys than no. the girls? Or was she kind of gender typical as much as I hate that terminology? Was it a shock, I guess, when she said she wanted to transition? You know, it was, it just didn't make sense. And I think what was so interesting about it was to see this, to see this idea seemingly come out of nowhere in this one relationship at the same time that it's kind Ooh. of coming in what seems from out of nowhere in society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And the things that I didn't understand at that time, oh, like, sorry, I think what I want to say about it is yeah. because I don't, I don't want to talk too much about, about the story that isn't, you know, mine, but I think that sure. what I felt sure. saying about it is that I did get the sense that my friend was under this pressure from equally a conservative family that had never been comfortable with same-sex attraction. And yes. She was gay. And okay. also from a friend group that besides me was 
you know, entirely like like a very queer friend group and that the conservative family and the queer mm-hmm. friend group converge on this solution of transition. Mm. Oh wow. And I got the sense that I was the only person in my friend's life who was like, boy, I just don't, I don't buy this. Like, I don't think that this is what's going on. And that experience really did, it gave me a sense of the kinds of pressures from within and without that people contemplating transition are under. And I also just mm-hmm. in trying to like keep a conversation going and to keep that conversation open-ended, um, I kind of had to follow my friend down a bunch of different internet rabbit holes. And by the time wow. my friend did decide to transition, it was like, I just knew way too much <laughs> to forget it. And were you, at the beginning, did you kind of say, oh no, uh, I, I'll support this much as I don't mm-hmm. get it. Or was there just a part you just thought, I, I don't think this is being a good friend to support yeah. it. Or what, you know, what was I your I think that's position? a good question. I, I would say that I always had doubts about it. I had doubts that affirming that was the right thing to do. And the more I looked into it, the more I doubted. But the promise that I made to my friend and the promise that I made to myself was, okay, as long as my friend is in the space of like questioning, I'm going to push back. And like, because I sense that everything is pulling in the same direction, except for me. And as soon as my friend decides what to do, I will support whatever that is. And that ended up being, that ended up being something that I regret. What, what did you regret? I think the pushing back or the support? I think this support because of the way that mm. everything came down in the end. It's hard. It's it's hard when you care about someone and yeah. sometimes you're facing a decision between maintaining the relationship and then kind of betraying your intuition about what you're going to agree with or what you're going to cheerlead along or what you're going to be silent about. It's such a hard situation. And as you mentioned, there's this thing creeping into society. And I think a lot of people are in the same boat as you, Mm -hmm. like someone I love, whether it's a child or a friend or a parent or whatever is going down this road. And I don't know how to draw the line or hold the line. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, there are all of these pressures on, on loved ones when, when someone in your life is going through this, where you don't want to, you don't want to collude with this idea that there is something wrong with who they are when you do not believe that at all. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. you also don't Mm -hmm. want to push too hard. And when you know that that'll be interpreted as at best, you don't get it. And at worst that you, you know, you're a bigot, you hate them. Things that could not be further from the truth. Yeah. It just, it does put people in an impossible situation when someone that they love transitions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's I've heard, amazing. I've heard, mm, sorry, no, go you ahead, go ahead. Stop. I was coming in with a random <laughs> song. You go ahead. Mm. Well, I, I'm just thinking about like this, this refrain that I've heard over and over when, when a parent specifically has a child who's maybe an adult mm-hmm. or going through this and they actually have zero capability in in their mind to to have any positive influence so what they do is they direct their energy towards something else and they get very invested in it and the level of like the volume and depth of analysis that you have produced is actually remarkable and I'm really interested to hear more about the contents of your research but I'm curious like do you think your feeling of like you know, impotence and helping mm-hmm. your friend is part of the reason why you have d- dove so deeply. Like you've done things in the gender research that a lot of people have not done, even though they're really invested. Like you show up at conferences and you're documenting all of these incredible things. And it's really remarkable. So do you think that plays a part of it here? Yeah, I think my mom would call it a displacement activity, right? It's mm. And I, I do see that, like you mentioned, with a lot of parents where you realize if you push or pull too hard with your kid right now, 
that relationship is going to break. And so that energy has to go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was, there were so many, it was such a fascinating subject to me that I think even without the personal connection, I would have been drawn into it. I mean, I'd been interested from, from yeah. 2013 and I just hadn't taken the initiative to really um, dig in. But I mean, from the very first time that I remember, you know, I worked in women's reproductive health advocacy and I remember this, like the kind of encroachment of supposedly inclusive language and that it just felt like this taboo that was being reinstated on women's speech. Mm. And that it was very clear to me that it was a distraction from organizing at a time when the state that I was living in was passing anti-abortion bills, you know, every couple of weeks during legislative session. And we were here arguing about language that made it harder for everybody to understand what's going on. Mm. And so are you just the type who gets herself immersed and then we'll get into, the, you know, the yeah. content now. So you kind of you got really into totalitarianism and then presumably you moved on. And by the sounds of it, you kind of got into women's mm -hmm. health reproduction or something, advocacy around that. And then because of life circumstances ended up in 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 this world. You know, there's a kind of a golden thread, really, that makes sense here. Yeah, I think that that's I think that's just the type of personality that I have. <laughs> yeah. And so what what did you begin with? <laughs> what did then. I begin with in understanding gender? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really wanted. I, I got I got somebody, somebody messaged me today and said, could you just give me, you know, a quick sna snapshot of what's going down? <laughs> like, you know, 200 words, 200 give me gender words in a page there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just just shoot it over to me. <laughs> oh, God, if any yeah. of us could. Boy, you can really <laughs> tell anyway. when some people are new. Because they're going to fix it. They're yeah. going to find the middle ground. They're going to summarize it in 200 words or less. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's just yeah, not yeah. that kind of just, subject. Just send me over it. Quick summary <laughs> there. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I did what I always do, which is that I read everything that I could possibly find on... I, when I decided to start really looking into it, it was just like... It was like I'd had this garment hanging in front of me that had a lot of loose threads and I just started pulling on them. And so I'd be mm. like, OK, is it, you know, testosterone, is it really safe for women to take this for the rest of their lives? And mm. what is, mm. you know, what are these different ideas of gender that are operating here that don't really make sense to me and that seem to be used in such contradictory ways? Um, and uh, that was maybe the thread that I followed the least far was the queer theory thread. It just... It was honestly the least interesting to me. And I went much more deeply into like, you know, the history of psychiatry, like all of the ways that um, that medicine has kind of, that both medical practitioners and patients have kind of converged on the female body as, an, as a, like a medium to express distress, that that had always been really fascinating mm -hmm. to me. And so I'm looking up, you know, hysteria and green sickness and, anorexia and multiple personality and like kind of falling down all these different rabbit holes and like looking at the, I mean, the pharmaceutical side of things. So the manufacturing of these, you know, these sex hormones, um, the selling of different diagnoses like ADD or ADHD or bipolar disorder and like finding all of these commonalities to, way, to the way that gender was being promoted. Um, the sociology of deviance, like I just, I really, I was living in DC and I was just spending all of my free time at the Library of Congress under that beautiful blue dome, just reading wow. <laughs> everything that I could think of that might help in any way. And what's that's actually <laughs> remarkable. Yeah, had you a plan? Were you writing a no. book or were you, was there a... No, wow. there was no, I mean, the plan, the plan had been for many years, I had been saving money to go to graduate school. And at this time, I was still working for um, a public health think tank. And, and so I was trying to come up with a research proposal for graduate school. And what I told myself at the beginning oh, was, mm. you know, you can research anything you want, but don't do the gender stuff. Like, you'll never find anybody <laughs> who will take you on. Like, nobody <laughs> wants to 
buy into like a personal lightning rod in their academic department. It's just not happening. So just do anything but that. But every time that I went to the Library of Congress. Wow. What year was oh, that? Gosh, this was like. What year was the? The year that I went really deep was like 2018, 2019. Oh, there were right. So, oh, well, yeah. Lightning rod. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I had been looking into it from about 2015 on. But. Um, yeah. And I just couldn't bring myself to come up with any other kind of research proposal. It just had to be this. I know what you mean. Yeah, it, it really becomes the most interesting and fascinating yeah. topic that you've ever seen. And so it's hard to look away. Yeah. Very hard. And, and I'm actually always shocked at how many people have heard of this and actually oh, don't no. get curious and lost in it. Like, I don't understand yeah. how you can know a little bit about this and not discover everything about this. But OK, to, to go back to your to your trajectory here, you also said earlier that you followed your friend down a lot of Internet mm -hmm. rabbit holes. And of course, your research specifically looks at these online communities and the way they shape people's perceptions about transition and detransition and mm -hmm. things like that. So, you know, you are researching all these other things and psychiatry and all these this stuff. When did you start looking specifically at the online communities? I started looking at the online communities in probably 2016, 2017, but just a little bit. Okay. And mm. at first, it's kind of hard to, you know, it's hard to make sense of kind of the local culture. <laughs> and yeah. over time, it's like if you, it's almost like an ethnography where if you observe it long enough, you start to understand like, okay, these are the norms. These are how things are talked about that yeah. It can be hard to recognize at first. Yeah. This is what people are socialized into. And I think the online the online side of this is so interesting to me because there has been this long relationship between online communities and transsexualism or transgenderism. Where, you know, from the 1980s on, you have these these men who identify as women who are ending up in these corners of the internet, like Usenet. And they're meeting mm -hmm. and they're swapping yeah. information about, you know, they're both they're like they're validating each other and they're reinforcing their sense of having this like marginalized identity. And so they're providing. And the yeah. very often, the very often nerd oh, yeah. computer types that were so into computers before, like Anne Lawrence yeah. and all that. They were they were way ahead of everybody else communicating. And, yeah, and, they yeah. were way ahead of everybody yeah. else. And so they're interacting in this space where they can be whoever they say they are. And they can be Ooh. women and they can validate each other as women in this online space where your body really doesn't matter. And then the other thing that they're doing at the same time is that they are swapping information on how to kind of navigate clinical gatekeeping and get the interventions yes. that they want. Yeah. And from, from, way, from back way back then. Yeah, from the 90s of course at least. They were. Yeah, online, of course. You know, I actually remember in our Pioneer series, and I don't remember who, I mean, at this Anne point, Lawrence. everything, no, no, but I remember but somebody else, a clinician saying there were even pamphlets developed like in the 70s, like before mm -hmm. internet, where people were telling each other how to get access to the hormones or what to say. So even pre-internet, I know that you know, individuals who were seeking transition were able to kind of coach mm -hmm. each other on totally. how to appear most, you know, convincing, quote unquote, to the clinicians when there was more, you know, gatekeeping. So it, it's, it's, of course, changes when the Internet and computers are used in this way, because, of course, it just creates more access and more mm -hmm. connectivity and things like that. And it, it removes the element of kind of in-person reality yes. testing because you can present yourself as whomever you like. You can doctor up your photo. You can have a screen name of yeah. whatever and put flowers all over your MySpace or whatever it is and really present what a, what seems to be, you know, a feminine mm -hmm. identity. And it's just, so interesting. Just before you come in, Eliza, it occurs to me that maybe for all we know, I don't know the beginning of WPATH, but it occurs to me it's very likely it was set up to kind of harness this energy and cultivate this knowledge in a more professional mm -hmm. way of how to get by all this, all this bureaucracy. Yeah. And which is how yeah. they thought. And so there's been this like long relationship and 
of course it really changes as the internet really changes and as the population of people who come to see themselves as transgender changes. But yeah, it's like from the very start, it has been the place to like explore gender in, like you say, like without the reality testing, without the friction of like social identity where other people do get some kind of mm -hmm. say in how they see us. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wow. felt that it wasn't, I, did, I think that you can't understand what's going on with kids and gender now without understanding, you know, the attitudes and the beliefs and the knowledge that kids are getting about gender and sex online. And then how that shapes the expectations that they have for transition and the intentions that they have for passing and surgeries and hormones and what life will be like and all of that. And did you go on, yeah. did you go on and kind of become a person, a persona online as if you were a trans person and infiltrated no. or is that very rude no. to ask you? <laughs> what did no, you I never did that. I, <laughs> I exclusively lurked. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so not only has the internet and kind of peer-to-peer -peer coaching always played a big role in how individuals mm -hmm. access transition services, but you're also noticing that with these online communities, it plays a huge role in shaping people who maybe are just beginning to yeah. question or maybe pre-questioning. And I'd like to touch on that a little bit because I think, oh, I just want to say, you know, I've interacted with some very intelligent clinicians and therapists in the last, you know, decade or so who get interested in this stuff, less than a decade maybe. But I've noticed that there's a huge gap in their capacity to appropriately address what's going on when they are not aware of the online mm -hmm. communities. Like you can be as intelligent as you want to be and have totally. amazing theories about like the role of, you know, the emotional life and like projection and all of these things. But actually you, you can't possibly understand this unless you know what's yeah. going on online. So I think it's important for anyone listening to just ground, like to ground us in that connection that this is inextricably linked and to further this point like sometimes i talk to families and say well my kids aren't really online that much and that's great right but the online concepts have completely yes. escaped the computer and they are are impacting school policy clinical policy so these ideas started in the internet without the reality testing and then they kind of go into mm -hmm. like wpath apa all these places so Sorry to, to kind of jump in there, but it's just so important for people to understand. Such a good point. Yeah, it's really important. And you're also touching on something where, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you had to be a pretty savvy person to find this transsexual content online. And now if you're a kid and you, mm -hmm. you know, you play like the Roblox video games or you're on social media or you're joining any kinds of like social networks, you were going to be prompted to question your gender almost like with yeah. almost unavoidable for kids online. Yeah. And you're going to be told that any unease that you feel about, you know, saying, oh, well, I identify as a girl and I, you know, I want to be treated as a girl and I want to be seen as a girl means that you're some kind of transgender. And I think that that's something that mm. a lot of people who haven't spent time online really don't understand is just how slippery how slippery the slope is kind of from being introduced to these ideas to being encouraged into kind of a new gender identification from first contact. But you mean for males, like if a male is prompted to question his identity and he says, I'd like to be seen as a girl. And I think that that's an example where like, I could imagine an outsider saying, well, yeah, what guy says they want to be seen as yeah. a girl. So can you talk about what is the slippery well, slope? How does it go from like being a pretty typical kid to like all of a sudden questioning? Yeah, so I was it? actually talking about girls, like girl, if a girl is prompted to say, do you want to be identified as a girl oh. and treated as a girl and seen as a girl in this online space where you actually have a choice? Oh. I, I think we can imagine a lot oh, of reasons okay. why a girl might be hesitant about that. I mean, I was, mm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when I was yes. a teenager, the internet was pretty different. But I also had, you know, strange encounters with adult men online who would kind of like, you know, they seem to just have this radar for young, naive women. So I didn't want to be treated yeah. as a girl on the internet. And if I had been told... Meaning if you, right, have, if a you choice, have a choice, you'd be like, well, yeah. maybe I don't. Maybe I'll go incognito yeah, maybe or I'll whatever. Go incognito, maybe it'd be easier to be a boy. 
<laughs> the thing is that this is the first mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. time. I think my, my guess is this is the first time in human history that kids are being presented with the idea that of what sex you are as a choice. And thus, mm-hmm. that if you are a girl and you say, yes, I'm happy to be identified as a girl, it is taken as consent to be sexualized, to be, in a lot of ways, just really diminished. And if you are a boy, it's taken as consent to, you know, there's been a lot of demonization of boys and men and masculinity and an association with this, you know, this toxic masculinity. I can see reasons why, you know, a sensitive kid of either sex might run into that and be like, boy, if it's a choice, like, I'm not okay with this. Yes. It's almost like an admission, right. a confession. Like, indeed, I am this aggressive, toxic, sexual predator. Right. Kind or of I'm this, you know, sexy, objectifiable piece of meat. Like, this doesn't, right. this is not a great deal right. for anybody. And then kids are yeah, told okay. that their discomfort That's... with being presented with this choice is something that makes them, puts them on the gender spectrum. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress Genspect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, Rhyme. Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And now back to the conversation. So how does this operate in these online communities? And like, maybe you can outline for us, where are you Mm -hmm. researching? Which communities online? And is the population in there questioning people, people who have already transitioned Mm -hmm. 20 years ago? Like who shows up in these communities and what are the communities you study? Sure. Um, So my focus has been on Reddit and I chose that for a couple of reasons. Um, One is... I wanted everything to be fully public. Um, I didn't want people to have an expectation of Mm -hmm. privacy that I would be violating if I, you know, create some profile and go into some private community. Um, There are also a lot of features of Reddit that make it well suited to this kind of research. So you can have, um, you know, you can check the user and the kinds of posts and comments that they've made over time. You get votes up and down both on, you know, post themselves and individual comments to kind of get an idea of community fit. And mm-hmm. and so like, how well does something adhere to a community consensus? And mm-hmm. there are a lot of communities that I kind of keep an eye on on Reddit. So some of them, and I don't know if you've talked about it on this the podcast would be like, there's an egg IRL community. And the idea is that like, um, it's basically a lot of memes that target young people online with very normal aspects of being a teenager or being a human being and then suggesting that this is something that makes you transgender and the idea is that Mm -hmm. you are an egg who is waiting to crack and you will crack when you realize that you're transgender um and i follow communities that are like ask transgender or um are trans but the ones that are the focus of my research are communities for female people um so Mm -hmm. The Reddit RFTM, FTM men, FTM over 30, and I also follow um, D-Trans and actual D-Trans. Pretty cl- Those are the five that I follow really closely. Okay. okay. Would you go into each of the five and just give us a snapshot and we can pick it like sure. a menu? <laughs> so that's what we'll go for. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think all of the FTM communities are pretty similar. Um, FTM over 30, obviously it's older, an older population. And I kind of like that as a counterpoint to the younger communities. Yeah. Um, FTM men is distinguished by being 
they would say maybe much more like binary. So they're, they're not interested in like the non-binary experience or like the trans mask experience. They're really interested in mm -hmm. you want to present and be seen and live as a man and probably to be stealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our D-trans and our actual D-trans are interesting foils for each other because one of them, our D-trans is basically, it's a detransition subreddit. It has about 45,000 members now. And, you know, the posts will really run the gamut from people who are questioning their gender transition, people who are wondering if they should transition in the first place and seeking advice, and people who have gone through any, you know, any number of interventions that you can imagine and reflecting on that experience. And there are a wide range mm -hmm. of, you know, ideological perspectives. There's a lot of, you know, I would say conflict within the community about how to think about their time that they spent in mm -hmm. the online trans communities. So some of them will say, oh, mm -hmm. it was really mm -hmm. cultish, or I feel like I was groomed. And some of them will say like, well, I think that there are still people who are really transgender and it just wasn't me. And maybe I really needed to mm -hmm. go through that phase of transition to figure out who I am. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. our actual detrans is basically, I would describe it as the ideologically mm -hmm compliant detransition subreddit where the idea is that everybody in that community is basically like okay it wasn't for me but i still totally believe in these theories about gender identity and the appropriateness of transition and i just made a mistake that's interesting so what do they mean by actually in that sense because i am surprised i thought it would be something very different i thought you were going to say these are people who medicalized and no. really regretted it and have co completely abandoned the whole no. idea. But what's the actual so, meaning here? A lot of online trans communities on Reddit were very unhappy with RD trans because it did enable people to really question the whole ideology and to criticize online trans communities. Okay. And actual D trans was kind of created as a community where it's like, okay, there are more detransitioners, they need somewhere to go. And it'd be great if they went to this place where they weren't actually like ideologically detransitioning, where they were still believing wow. all the same things and being committed to being good allies to the trans community and not seeing bad things about their experience. Okay. It's, it's almost like priests leaving a seminary <laughs> and, and some of the priests still believe in God. And in fairness, they're very good and they're very mm -hmm. holy. And other priests say, no, I, I've lost my yes. faith. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe the two communities. So what's the fifth? We have FTM over yeah. 30, FTM men, RD trans, RFTM. Oh, the, D -trans. the fifth one is just the regular RFTM, which is the biggest female to male okay. transgender community on Reddit. Okay. How big is it? Oh, gosh. Do you know? I, I mean, they're changing all the Probably time. Massive. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Something that Stella and I wanted to do a full episode on, and I imagine we will, but I think we could start the appetizer portion here, is internalized mm -hmm. transphobia. Oh, yeah. And how these communities deal with people's mm -hmm. doubts about questioning their identity, about transitioning, about harms they feel they've incurred from transitioning. So talk to us a bit about what you've discovered there in yeah. your research. So this has been probably the area that was the most fascinating to me the more time that I spent in these communities, I realized that the doubt is really taboo. Like, you're really not allowed to mm -hmm. doubt the belief system as a whole. You're not supposed to question other people's gender identity, even if they come on and they have, even if they come on and they're expressing doubts about their own identity and they're expressing a bunch of, you know, factors that might be contributing. You're not supposed to doubt it. You can express reservations about your own identity, but they have to be couched in a particular way that kind of neutralizes the threat that they pose to the belief system as the whole as a whole and to the identifications of other people in the community. Could you give an yeah. example to make to make that more real for people? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think the way that the way that doubts tend to be talked about and, and these will kind of lend themselves to some examples would be one is internalized transphobia. So if you are unsure about your identity, if you're uncomfortable being, you know, visibly trans, if you have doubts about transition, if you're anxious about coming out to people, like a lot of these doubts will surface when somebody is about to take whatever the next step is in transition. 
Mm -hmm. Um, A common way to talk about those doubts when they manifest is to say, I think that my internalized transphobia is really like kicking up because, you know, it's really hard for me to schedule my top surgery or I got my legal name change documents and I have really mixed feelings about it, which I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Or I feel weird when people gender me correctly. Mm. And they'll say, so I really need to work on my internalized transphobia. You're basically saying to the community, I know that I have a problem. Like I have these internal structures of bias and they're hurting me and I'm dealing with them because they also hurt. The belief is that they also hurt other people, that they hurt other trans people for you to hold these beliefs. Because if you doubt your own identity, then you're probably doubting other people's identities, even if you never say it out loud. Yeah. How is is passing or wanting to pass framed in this perspective? Because I, th- I think what happens sometimes is like a person recognizes mm-hmm. they don't pass, but even that recognition is seen as transphobia. Yeah, I mean, passing is a very hmm. touchy subject because you will basically... <laughs> so the bargain that these communities make is that you will have an audience mm-hmm. for any thought or negative rumination in particular that you have, no matter how small, no matter how neurotic, Mm. and Mm. you will have an audience to air that, but you will also be exposed to everybody else's really dark 3 a.m. thoughts and ruminations, and they will feed each other. And so when it comes to something like passing, which is a pretty frequent subject on the FTM subreddits, you know, people will say, oh, I feel really bad about my height because I'm only 5'4", and then, wow, you really made everybody who's under 5'4 feel like shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. you know, they will, yeah. they'll obsess about, you know, the angle of your arm and that women have maybe a more curved forearm or the way that you stand or all, you know, it, <laughs> the similarity to kind of online pro-anorexia communities is really striking in that... Yeah. These communities constantly seed new things for members to be dysphoric about. Mm -hmm. Wow. And does anybody come in and say, I I renounce passing, I'm trying. Yes, there are definitely people who say, (laughs) yeah, I mean, passing, there are people who say that passing is really problematic because it means you don't want to be identified as part of this community. Yeah, it's transphobic. Well, everything. I mean, everything can be transphobic. It's just the way you look at it. <laughs> but I actually think trying to pass is actually arguably yeah. transphobic. Yeah. So there will be these different, <laughs> you know, partisan camps. The passing camp, the stealth camp. Yeah. I'm out and I'm trans yeah. camp. Mm-hmm. What about the way people, because you alluded to this, like, well, let's say people are experimenting with their identity and people in their Mm -hmm. real life, their friends, their family, their parents, their wife, their spouse is having problems with it. And then people bring those scenarios to the community. What happens in these online communities? Yeah. So this is part of the kind of socialization into trans process is how to deal with your offline relationships and what kinds of expectations you have for loved ones are really set in these online communities. Um, Basically, and this is something that it's it's hard to it's hard to communicate how pervasive this is. Um, yeah, there is there are the, these communities set an expectation for how people in your life will treat you, how they will see you, what it means when they mess up. So if they use a pronoun that they don't want you mm. to use, or that you don't want them to use, or if they use your old name because they're your mom and they've called you that for, you know, 15 years. Oh, yeah. Um, The community will attach to these kinds of pretty, pretty innocent and pretty normal hiccups in complex human relationships and say, like, okay, well, they're not really accepting. They don't really understand you. We understand you. Um, And there's an encouragement to distance yourself from people who don't understand. Um, whether that's to invest Mm -hmm. more and more of your life to, whether that is you're a teenager, you have to live under your parents' roof, but you're going to invest more and more of your private life online and keep it away from your parents or whether it's 
pushing for actual like family estrangement or cutting friends out of your life if they don't go along. And did you, when you had eating mm -hmm. disorders, were you interested in the pro Anna sites? And do you do you see much likenesses or parallels? And do you see differences? Yeah. In those communities. So those sites definitely existed when I had an eating disorder, and I did not know about them, and was no part of them. Yeah. Thank God for you. They were awful. Yeah, I have looked at yeah. them. They were the first, my first introduction. Just for people who, who don't know, they were kind of the early naughties mm -hmm. in my world, anyway. And they were really encouraging an awful lot of anorexic people to be even further and the same with bulimic and stuff. Yeah. And they were my first. I remember it was a, a shrieking realization of what online communities could do. Yeah. I remember I, I wasn't even a mm. psychotherapist at the time, but thinking oh, that is so dangerous. Yeah. That is so dangerous yeah. that they're all going to be. For sure. I remember clocking that. Yeah. yeah. And it really does sound like those online communities like they bring the kinds of dynamics that you can have in an inpatient facility where it's so easy for like yeah, anorexics to like edit each other on without experts. anybody like monitoring it and being like, okay, we're breaking up this like session. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I was not involved in those, but having looked at them since, like, I think that they're very similar in terms of the way that they function I'm, from, from things like, you know, everybody is the idea that everybody's valid. So this is an interesting feature mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. pro anorexia communities mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. you're often encouraged to post, you know, your current weight, your highest weight, your goal weight. And from those statistics, from those stats that you put on every post, it'll be obvious that some of these people are not anorexic. But they will be mm. validated as anorexic. Wow. So there's this kind of weird acceptance. There's a competitiveness that people are trying to squash um, like even though people tend to be competitive it's, it, with it's or, like this passive or there's aggression. a collusion of come into our uh, come in, oh passive i was thinking come into our yeah. community yes come on. yeah i mean it's on the one hand it's this source of like social support and nobody else understands and we understand and even if you're not hitting you know the weight loss target that would make you a clinical anorexic like the aspiration is there and we see that like that's part of it and they have those kind of that the competitive dynamic is still there, even if it's kind of glossed over. Mm. And also anorexics quite like to be around people who, who aren't anorexic right. and they f can feel mu much better than them yeah. and much skinnier than them. I mean, like, it's quite you just feel so disciplined. <laughs> so much yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Stronger. Yeah. Before we before we get towards the end, I mean, we have to talk about your experiences going to these gender affirmative care conferences, because, you know, we, we have to build mm -hmm. the bridge like there's these online communities where young people are basically being coached to, you know, suppress their doubts, continue down. You know, the more trans mm -hmm. you are, the better. Like there's there's nowhere within these communities where people say, actually, you should probably slow down and this is right. not best for you. You can't do that. Like you said, you can't question other people's identity. And as you've been reporting on gender affirmative care conferences you've gone to, you've remarked about the same lack of, like, in what scenario would a patient not be yes. appropriate for transition? Yeah. And there seems to be very few. So can you just, uh, like as the joke goes, summarize in 20 words or less <laughs> what you've discovered from attending hours and hours and hours of gender care conferences. Just help people who have never heard of what gender affirmative yeah. care is. Help them understand what yeah. is it. I mean, for practitioners and for patients alike, it is a belief system that can survive a remarkable amount of contact with inconvenient reality. Yeah. Yeah. And really? Yeah. So I went to the WPATH conference in Montreal about six months ago. Um, and I also went to EPATH a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that I was really struck by at EPATH in particular was that you could see, you could see that in the six months that had passed between the two conferences, criticism of kind of the gender affirmative care model had become much more widespread. There had been much more like uptick in the media of like asking questions. People felt more under attack who practiced this. And so the conference had to address some points of controversy. 
And they had to mention mm. rapid onset gender dysphoria. They had to mention um, concerns about puberty blockers and what they would basically do in every case. The transition? Yeah. And what they would basically do in every case yeah. is that they would be like, so this is, you know, an open, we don't know everything about this, but it also basically doesn't matter. So maybe there is this new presentation of adolescent females that we didn't see coming to gender clinics before, but they're also trans. And so the affirmative care model is also appropriate mm -hmm. for them. And we don't want to be gatekeepers, be gatekeepers. Which, which again, it's in line with the, the philosophy, the belief system. Yeah, there is this kind of contrary exercise of medical authority at work where it's like, you are doing things that only a medical provider can do, like prescribe drugs mm -hmm. and operate on healthy body parts but you are yeah. doing them in a setting in which you have handed over your professional judgment to your patient and specifically to wow. the patient's kind of transgender alter that both the patient and the doctor believe very strongly in and which they will carve out of the actually existing patients like flesh and biography and they will ignore everything that they need to ignore to bring this transgender alter into being. And I think that this existence of this transgender alter to which doctors feel this intense loyalty is what really allows them to, to do all of the things that so alarm people who haven't been sufficiently indoctrinated, like mastectomies on 15 year olds. Um, it lets them feel like it lets them dismiss a lot of the criticism they get because they feel like they're being misunderstood and that they're being accused of not caring for their patients. And they care in many cases very much, mm -hmm. but they are caring for something that does not exist in the same way that a patient who has a life history and maybe has trauma, maybe has been bullied for being same sex attracted, maybe has an eating disorder, maybe has any number of, you know, mental health comorbidities, like that patient exists in the way that that patient's transgender alter does not. And the belief mm -hmm. in this alter allows them to do basically mm -hmm. unlimited harm to the actual patient while believing mm -hmm. that they're doing good. Mm. Do you, did you see much in these conference, did you see many clinicians giving presentations who are kind of leaving themselves room to kind of pull back a bit? Because quite a few affirmative conditions have started to pull back and say, actually, maybe I was wrong. Some have started to pull back. I would say that that's not really happening at the conferences that I've seen. The conferences are much yeah. more, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the features that was so oh, interesting man. about EPATH was, on the one hand, there's this strong commitment to kind of the appearance of scientific inquiry and rigor and the realization that like, you know, I mean, we were talking about this earlier when we said, I don't understand how people can come into contact with the subject and not be fascinated. And yet you go to these conferences yeah. mm -hmm. and you listen to these clinicians and yeah. researchers and there's this remarkable lack of curiosity. Like there's an extent to which they talk yeah. about this all the time, but they're not fascinated because they don't no. really mm -hmm. want to know the answer to a lot of the very obvious questions mm -hmm. that stare them in the face. Or they've, mm -hmm. or they've shut their mind to certain... Or they've closed certain avenues of inquiry yeah. off. Yeah. And that that's very striking. And I think... I think less... This isn't quite the same thing as maybe making space to be wrong. The way that a few clinicians have been backing away, like Erica Anderson maybe has been saying, maybe this isn't appropriate for all the kids who are seeking it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But what I definitely mm -hmm. noticed at EPATH was this very striking downgrading of expectations for global improvement as a result of, you know, quote unquote, gender affirming care. And the shift to, okay, so we treated the gender incongruence. So it was, it was a success, even if the patient, you know, yeah. even if their mental health goes uh -huh. off a cliff. Who cares? Yeah. We treated the gender. Yeah. The, the presenting problem was gender. We treated that. And frankly, if their mental health, it's, it's something for some other people yeah. to deal with because we're doing and this was It's the silos. Yeah, and this yeah. was something that was really obvious in the conversation that you two had with Steensman DeVries, which I still think about all the time, where 
they really had these incredibly low expectations for their patients. And mm -hmm. like Steensma kept comparing, intervening on, you know, the bodies of healthy children who were very distressed to giving insulin to a diabetic. And if the insulin doesn't mean, mm -hmm. you know, if they take insulin and then they don't have a satisfying relationship and they're not comfortable with their body, like you wouldn't blame the insulin and you certainly wouldn't blame the doctor who prescribed yeah. it. It's exactly yeah. the mentality. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I feel like as the data comes in and the data doesn't live up to, you know, life-saving gender affirming care, all of those promises that were made, that the way that clinicians are making space for that is to say we treated the gender incongruence. Well, I mean, your concept of the trans altar is fascinating because I, I think what we're touching on here is the belief that underlies yeah. all of this and all of the weird cognitive dissonance that never gets addressed is that the transgender alter, the creation of that individual subsumes all other aspects yes. of the self, all other mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting framing. I haven't heard anyone put it that way. And you've touched on like EPATH and gender affirmative care being based on a, a belief. Tie that together. What is the belief? If you were to try and ex explicate it as best as you can, what is the belief that these individuals seem mm -hmm. to be operating under? I think that if you believe that a patient can be really transgender in the sense that you believe that someone can be really diabetic, that comparison that they love so much, then it's true that nothing else that's in that patient's biography, nothing that's in the culture, nothing that no idea that they run into online or anywhere else matters. You get to dismiss it all. And, you know, I mean, this mm -hmm. has been a really common, I want to call it like a fantasy within medicine, within psychiatry in particular, that like, there will be some ultimate source that in the future we will find that will vindicate everything that right now we can only see the signs yeah. of. Yeah. Which, which every, so many cults which, lived on yes, that. It's coming, that it's too, coming, it's coming. That too. Yeah. But it's like in the future, everybody will know and will, that there was such a thing as being really trans and where to find it. But right yeah. now we have to believe in it. We're, leave, we're living on yes. this. Yeah. But, but, but I think even more, I mean, a, a framing that I've heard more recently that didn't exist, I think, mm -hmm. 20 years ago in gender medicine is embodiment mm -hmm. goals. Oh, so embodiment goals actually completely sidestep the idea that someone is truly it trans. It's basically saying individuals can carve out and create like a, like a designer identity anything they want and there's no requirement for being truly mm. trans and i don't know if i've misread that no. term but to me that feels very much like what we're talking about here yeah like the whole eunuch identity mm. like you know there it's a stretch to say somebody <clears throat> was born with a eunuch identity to, i mean i'm sure some people do but it feels much more like aesthetic preference or something yeah i think <sighs> So I, I see what you mean, and I think that embodiment goals is a way to say patient subjectivity isn't something that we have access to, and we just have to rely mm. on the patient. And what we can go mm. by is their embodiment goals, or this sense of gender incongruence. Like, those seem to me to be, like, kind of companion. You, you're, you're right, but it does, uh, what, what Sasha's bringing up does kind of raise a, a, a fundamental conflict within the mm -hmm. WPATH ethos, which is yes. some of them believe in gender identity theory, mm -hmm. that there's a gender identity within you that needs to be medicalized and got out, you know, as such and made presentable in, in, the, in the body form. Mm -hmm. And others subscribe to queer theory, which is yes. much more about embodiment. Mm -hmm. And they live together. That you know, yeah. it's like they they slightly they, they they kind of have two different mindsets, but they're living together because just like Eliza said, because fundamentally, what the client, the customer, the patient says is God. Mm -hmm. You know what they say is everything. So we leave it all on the shoulders of that person, mm -hmm. and therefore we will never dare to say that we might have a view on it. Yeah, that's their get out. Yes. it's all down to you, whether you're four mm. or fourteen or 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 84 it's all down yes. to you and that 
means that the person, no matter in what state they are, if they have psychosis, they're driving. They're in the driving mm -hmm. seat and everybody has to follow that person. Yeah. Extraordinary. And there's one thing I wanted to ask is uh, it feels seismic to me, you know, in all the WPATH conferences and the EPATH conference. So WPATH was in Montreal last September and EPATH was in Killarney just in, in April, May. And um, the, for the first time ever, as far as I can gather, EPATH mentioned ROGD. Yes. Is that right? Or they, they alluded, alluded to it in to their it. subtle way. Yeah. Did anybody ring Lisa Littman? She was down the road. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lisa, we're talking about oral duty. How did they allude to it? Yeah. And how, how kind of straight? So this is rapid mm. onset gender dysphoria. And it was first written about by Lisa Littman in 2018. She was in the Genspec conference a mile down the road discussing, you know, what she's learned in the last mm -hmm. five years since she first described this phenomenon of the female girls. And they, for the first time ever, made mention to this scenario yeah they made allusions to it so they mostly used other terminology way. they would be like you know late onset gender dysphoria or sudden onset gender dysphoria um or one person did say rapid onset gender dysphoria. anything anything but anything but no one person did say it dysphoria. but then said that she would understand if people wanted to leave the room when they heard her say that oh yeah did she did yes. she yes. really what, how, do you remember how she said it? Leave the um, room. You know, it was one of the Dutch researchers who was presenting a list of kind of like how open questions in gender medicine. And mm. for everyone, she was kind of like, and I understand if you like really don't want to talk about this. And, and they didn't really talk about any of them, but she named them. Um, so, so how was it framed in the conference? In the conference, it's framed as a new cohort that we didn't see before, but who are also really transgender and who are more likely to be doubted. And that if there is any concern, oh. that they're more likely to be doubted because they don't have this like manifest childhood history. And that the major concern with the sudden explosion of adolescent girls is not about the girls and what's going on with them, but is about well, where are the boys? Like, it must be easier for girls to come out. There must be more social acceptance for girls. Yeah. And so they make it about yeah. these missing boys rather than having curiosity about the explosion of girls. And I, and I do think this is important to mention where we don't get too, um, too uh, excited about EPATH mentioning this phenomenon. <laughs> the poster award that they gave for the conference was to research that debunked ROGD. Mm -hmm. Of course, it didn't debunk it. Mm -hmm. But it was like, well, mm -hmm. other online identities maybe also have some social contagion. So the ROGD stuff isn't a thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I'm less excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I have. I, I, you know, I think something that I, I feel really torn about is like, Philosophically, I really believe in open to debate, mm -hmm. dialogue, giving people on the other side of a perspective Me too, the yeah. benefit of the doubt and yeah. engaging. I really believe in it. And also, at the same time, I try to be a realist and I try to keep my eyes open. And I have not seen any really compelling reason to believe that the extremists in the gender affirmative care world are even kind of like living in the same planet that I am. Like, it's so messed up yeah. to say that because I don't want to say things like that. But we're talking about completely different paradigms about existence, yeah. about life, about the health of a person, about bodies, about identity, about mental health. So it's just like whenever I hear this kind of reporting from the inside of EPATH and WPATH, for the most part, I'm thinking, yeah. oh, my God, like, how do we bridge the gap here, yeah. actually? Yeah. No, for me, too. They have such a different conception of what medicine is and what it means to heal somebody. And mm. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like people who believe and people who don't believe. And how can we rock along and treat mm -hmm. these patients? Ooh. we've got rocky roads ahead of us yeah 
Yeah. Is there any cause for hope in recent online conversations? And you don't have to come up with them because we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Just if you happen to think of any. Gosh, recent cause for hope in online conversations. Um, I think I, I've been in general pretty alarmed by the tenor of online conversations over the last year or two. Like I have noticed a lot of radicalization in online trans spaces and Oh, so you've noticed it getting significantly worse? I've noticed worse. it getting significantly worse. And, like, we can see that increasingly, like, kind of poking up in other places, like in U.S. politics, where there are these, or at EPAP, mm -hmm. where the language of transgenocide has, like, broken into the open. And that incubated online, out of all connection with wow. reality. So, on the one hand, I feel like we are watching this dynamic of these communities radicalizing and that radicalization spreading into the broader society. On the other hand, I think, you know, it can be really heartbreaking, but it can also be really heartening to read the detrans community. And you can see people who mm -hmm. have a lot of curiosity and self-reflection and who are trying to make sense of their experience and then trying to figure out with what to do with that. Yeah. Just before we kind of mm -hmm. wrap it up soon, do you see many who kind of pull out the reflective ones who kind of you, you see, God, I don't see that username anymore. They were they were always going to pull out. Do you see much of that? Um, I mean, the communities are too big to be able to to do. Yeah, that. Okay, to really yeah. see. Yeah, thousands yeah, and they thousands, have thousands and thousands people. of members and people usually stand out for other reasons than. Um, OK. And, and, and I think the important thing about the, the online communities and the whole belief system is that it really is just like a trap and it can turn the most penetrating intelligence against itself. And so it's not, you know, this person is too smart for this mm. or this person is too self-reflective. No. I know, but I suppose you can hear in other online communities I've been in and there's sometimes thousands, I start following yeah. one or two people that I just like, the, I start following where they're going and stuff like that. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. I, I have another sure. question. I know we, we could keep you here forever, but um, I I have kind of suspected for some time that there might be like an anti-medicalization mm -hmm. nugget available here, partially because of mm -hmm. queer theory and the way like it throws male and female out the window altogether, which of course I don't agree with it, but I do see there's an opportunity to reduce the urgency for medical interventions have you seen that thread at all yeah there are definitely kind of competing strains online um one of the this is one of the places where like kind of the sex dynamic becomes really interesting because in general mm. gender distress or you know gender having a transgender identity is much less medicalized for males than for females and you know, I have this hope that maybe that can spread beyond males who identify as trans to um, females who identify as trans. I had a had a brief hope that non-binary would kind of serve this function and that people would be like, well, I'm, you know, special yeah. and different and I don't need to do anything. So did I. But that seems to be so increasingly I. medicalized, both. So did yeah, I, yeah. Like, yeah. Mastectomies yeah. and non-binary have really I seemed mean, to show I mean, all of the yeah. crazy stuff coming out of, like, San Francisco with, like, the phallus-preserving vaginoplasty like there seems to be both from the ground up and the top down this broadening slate yeah. of like customize your meat suit options so like that's Ugh, like there's that's that. happening at the same time huh. that Ugh. like some of these communities are saying more like well i shouldn't have to do anything to be valid and to be recognized i, I can be uh, yeah I can be accused of being Pollyanna, but it does occur to me that it is becoming more queer theory esque, okay. more body modification, more w what your body wants, embodiment, which Sasha was talking mm -hmm. about. It, it feels like it's going more that direction with the non binary, with all the, you know, the new genders, and we're going to medicalize yeah. them, which to me is moving towards, well, it's what I want. Yeah. As opposed to that kind of, we need it. I, there's something more workable with somebody who says I want it then I need it why are you getting in the way of my life yeah oh. and I think that oh. there's for the people 
who want to kind of hang on to the justifications that have surrounded transition, that it's life-saving, that it's essential care. I think that there is a risk for that group that the I want it, I want to customize my body, the human body, mm-hmm. like the opposite sex's body is not a template for what I want, like this endless creativity. Right. Like, I think that there's a possibility that that kind of customization route undercuts the arguments for the life-saving gender for yeah. care that we cover with insurance route. Yeah. yeah. And that'll yes, be interesting yes. to watch. Yes, completely. Yeah. 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 Well, we're, we would love to talk to you forever. I know every time you and I have connected, I'm just like, oh, I could have used 10 oh, more Oh, me hours too. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we'll do okay. this again and we'll talk more about uh, language. I mean, we've, we've touched on it a little bit, but that's such an interesting piece of this. Yeah. Um, other than your sub stack, which we'll definitely include in our notes, is there anywhere else you'd like to direct listeners? No, I think everything that I do ends up there in some form or another. And I would love to okay. talk more about online communities or doubt or anything you guys want. It's I really oh, love okay. everything that you do. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. Thank you. We feel the same way about you. <laughs> we love us. You have a big pineapple <laughs> there. Maybe we can talk about fruit next time you come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we miss them. All right, Eliza. Well, thank right, you. Thanks. thanks a million. That's fascinating. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.